Uh, so, good day there. I'm Steve Chadban. I'm here from Sydney in Australia. Welcome to this lunchtime symposium sponsored by KDigo, together with GlaxoSmithKline, looking at the impact of viral infections in patients with kidney diseases and the role of vaccination in kidney care. These are our disclaimers. Firstly, I'd like to thank um, the Swedish Sunshine and the Swedes for hosting us at this wonderful venue. I would personally like to take some credit for bringing this fantastic weather all the way from Australia to Sweden. We have a, we have a multinational panel, Professor Yuen Hungdo from Switzerland, who is a nephrologist, as is Professor Michel Jadou from Belgium. And to round our team out, we have a transplant infectious diseases specialist, uh, Professor Dipali Kumar from Toronto in Canada, who is actually the immediate past president of the American Transplantation Society. So I think we have a strong team. Our topics today are to look at viral encounters and understanding the burden on kidney health, followed by two case studies, one in CKD, and one in patients receiving dialysis, and then a third addressing the kidney transplant recipient. At the end of our presentations, which will be around 10 minutes each, we will have plenty of time for a panel discussion. And we would encourage you to either send your questions in electronically or alternately, please to move to a microphone and provide your name and origin and your question. Before we get underway, a couple of housekeeping matters. Please do set your mobile phones to silent for the courtesy of everybody here. Please do save your questions and answers for the Q&A session. And at the end of the session, we would really appreciate your feedback so that we can improve these sessions for years to come. Please also note that this session will be recorded. Without further ado then, I'd like to hand to my colleague, Professor Yuen, Hundo to speak on understanding the burden on kidney health. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the nice introduction. And I'd like to thank uh, the organizer for giving me the opportunity to come to this wonderful city and talk about one of my favorite topics, which is really CKD inflammation and uh, immunity. And so um, in this first uh, session, I would like to set the frame for this session. And uh, in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to give you an overview on the impact of viral diseases on kidney health in general, but also on health uh, of our patients. Now, as nephrologists, we all know that our patients are in a state of impaired immunity, even if they are not on immunosuppressive drug. But this is something that our colleagues from GP or general internal medicine or cardiology are not enough aware of. And this is something I always repeat, telling them why. Well, first we know that uremic environment and toxin uh, lead through multiple mechanisms to impaired functions of T and B cells, but also dendritic cells, macrophage, and PMN. On the other hand, uh, the environment is permissive for oxidative stress, endothelial dysfunction, and so we can say that CKD in general can be defined as a state of low-grade inflammation and subsequently uh, of impaired immunity, and even more if our patients have comorbidities such as old age, diabetes, or CVD. And so these all factors make our patients at increased risk for infections. On the other hand, viral disease by inducing inflammatory cytokines, inducing hypercarbulities, and um, making plaques destabilize, um, in, uh, induce a vicious circle of uh, CKD progression, but also more complications. And so we have a bilateral relationship between viral disease in general and chronic conditions, not only CKD, but also, for example, COPD or cardiovascular diseases. Now, I'm going to give you two examples. Um, so, uh, we are in 2024, so I'm not going to talk about COVID, although COVID was really the example par excellence of this virtual cycle. So, I'm going to talk first about RSV. 
Now, this is a very nice study which has been published recently, 2024. And the authors have looked at two data banks in two countries, Denmark and Scotland. So they looked at the risk factors for RSV infection and associated hospitalization. So those are relevant association. And they looked at uh, seven different comorbidities. And as you can see here, um, there are interesting differences between Denmark and Scotland. But what you can see here is that, now I don't see the pointer working. Anyway, so what you... Huh? Okay, so what you can see here, um, so about the common DDCs, what you can see here, you see CKD. And you see that in Denmark, compared to the other comorbidities, CKD is the highest risk factor because you have a tenfold higher risk for RSV in patients with CKD. It's a little bit different in Scotland when you have only threefold, but it's still quite high. In Scotland, the higher comorbidity is a COPD, where you have a six-fold increase. But if you look at Denmark again, you have a 4.5 increase of risk for RSV in patients with CKD. So this is really highly relevant. The second example is herpes zoster, and I've chosen for you a quite recent meta-analysis, which is quite inclusive because it's including 18 CKD studies. And uh, as you can see here, um, our patients here with CKD have a higher risk. Sorry. 0.3 uh, um, higher risk for uh, infections with RSV. And if you look at our patients uh, with, uh, with SLA, then it goes up to 1.8. And diabetes is also quite high. There's a more recent meta-analysis, including patients with transplantation. And in this case, the risk uh, factor is four to five-fold higher to get herpes zoster in our transplant patients. Now, this is a study what we did in Switzerland. So, in Switzerland, we have the so-called Swiss transplant cohort study. This is a study running since 2007, when all patients with solid organ transplant, so almost 98% of all those patients are included in the uh, cohort, and they have a follow-up yearly, including by banking. In this study, we looked at the incidence and prevalence of relevant infections in the first years. And as you can see here, in the first 50 days, um, up to 50% of heart transplant patients have had at least one relevant infection leading to hospitalization. At about 30% of our kidney patients have the same. And you can see on the right side a higher granularity of these infections. So of course we are quite early, so most of the infections will be, inf uh, will be bacterial infections. But if you look at viral infections, roughly 30% of those infections in the first 50 days will be viral infection. Of those, almost 50% of them will be herpes virus. The highest, of course, in heart transplant, almost 60%, but in kidney and pancreas transplant, almost 40%. So really, we uh, realize that in this population, we, we got to give them some possibilities uh, to have some prevention. Now, um, I talked about the vicious circles of infections, CKD and mortality, and I'm going to give you here some examples from studies. So this is an older study from USRDS, but again, it's quite nice because they compared the risk for different infections, so UTI, pneumonia, etc., in CKD versus non-CKD patients, and you see that CKD uh, makes a two to three-fold higher in, uh, infection risk. And here, when you look at the different uh, uh, kind of CKD patients, hemodialysis, PD, or transplant, you see that in all those patients, not only infections, but also cardiovascular disease are one of the major reasons for hospitalization, but also morbidity. And we all know that cardiovascular disease is highly correlated with previous infection. Now, uh, the point is, do viral disease also influence CKD progression? The answer is yes. And this study shows, this is um, a study which looks at the outcome uh, of infection on cardiovascular ischemia, end stage real disease and mortality. And you see here that uh, when you look at the odds ratio for 
cardiovascular ischemia or chronic uh, heart infections, you have a threefold higher rates of them. But CKD is definitely higher in the patient who had had a previous infection. So this really illustrates that we got, if you want to, to uh, influence CKD progression, we also got to have efficient way to prevent those viral infection. And those are quite high numbers of patients. And finally, this is a very nice study coming from Taiwan. So this is, uh, those are uh, patients from a data bank. So you have a whole population of about 15,000 people with CKD in Taiwan. And they looked at the incidence of herpes zoster virus in the general population and compared them with patients with CKD. Uh, with different comorbidities, and you see here that in general, when uh, patients had herpes zoster, they were at higher risk to develop afterwards CKD. This is 10 years after herpes zoster, and you see really a significant difference and higher risk to develop CKD in patients who have had herpes zoster. And this is really a nice study because it's really a population-based study. It is quite inclusive and you have really a high number of patients. You also have those comorbidities and you have a longer follow-up of up to 10 years. So uh, in conclusion, chronic kidney disease is a state of chronic inflammation and impaired immunity. And so therefore, there are increased risks for infectious disease in general and viral disease in particular. Importantly, those infections are independently associated with further progression of CKD, but also with cardiovascular disease and mortality with all the economic uh, consequences. And therefore, efficient diagnostics tools, prevention and treatment modalities are still highly needed in 2024. And this is what you're going to hear in the next uh, sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful talk. As we mentioned earlier, we're going to ask you to save up your Q&A for the Q&A session at the end. We're going to now move from epidemiology into some case-based stuff. CKD, firstly, then dialysis, and then transplantation. So I'm firstly going to illustrate navigating the risks for patients with CKD. Uh, these are my disclaimers, and these are my disclosures. My case is that of a 73 years old retired factory worker in Sydney who was born in Greece and was living independently with his wife. He was known to have ischemic heart disease with a previous type 1 AMI managed with a stent. He had mitral regurgitation and modestly reduced left ventricular ejection fraction but was asymptomatic from a cardiovascular perspective. He had background hypertension and dyslipidemia and was an ex-smoker having quit when he had his myocardial infarction. And he presented to our hospital in 2021 with nephrotic syndrome. At that time, his urinary ACR was 1,200 milligrams per millimole. His serum albumin significantly reduced at 21 grams per litre, but EGFR was relatively preserved at 75. He underwent a kidney biopsy, which showed classical changes of early stage membranous nephropathy with well-preserved tubular interstitium. Viral studies for hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV were all negative. PLA2 uh, positive antibodies were present, and therefore we made a diagnosis of primary membranous nephropathy. We instituted typical treatment with two rounds of rituximab and symptomatic management with diuretics and ACE inhibition. And at the three month mark, he was in remission with an ACR down to 15 milligrams per millimole, correction of serum albumin, loss of nephrotic syndromes, and preservation of EGFR. His PLA2R had become negative. So what would you do at this stage? I think that as nephrologists, we're very good at assessing cardiovascular risk and addressing that. And I think we're very good at considering anti-progression strategies from a CKD perspective. But do we consider infective risks enough? And considering this patient, what might be done to reduce subsequent infection risk? 
We've seen some very solid epidemiological data already from my colleague demonstrating the increased risks of viral infection in CKD populations. This is a single centre study from Turkey which looked at the incidence of infective episodes within this cohort divided by patients who received immunosuppression and those who did not. And here you can see in the top graph that pulmonary infection, particularly in those who received immunosuppression, was the number one driver in, of infection, followed by genitourinary, skin and upper respiratory tract infections. The key risk for these were age greater than 50 years, clearly prevalent in my patient, a low serum albumin, or previous receipt of cyclophosphamide or cyclosporin. Notably, none of the patients in this study were on rituximab, and in our clinical practice, lymphopenia following rituximab is clearly a risk factor for future viral infections. So what does KDGO tell us about managing such patients with CKD? Here, practice points would advocate use of pneumococcal vaccine, which we did, would advocate seasonal influenza vaccine, which we did, and would now advocate for herpes zoster vaccination. Since the KDGO guidelines in 21, I think we would all also advocate for COVID-19 vaccination, which we also performed for this man. But which, should we consider other vaccines? <clears throat> Three months later, my patient attended the emergency department with a 12-hour history of fever and rigors. There was no pleurisy and no sputum. There had been a preceding chorizal illness with a sore throat and a runny nose, and notably the patient's grandson had had similar symptoms five days previously. On presentation, the blood count was normal, the EGFR was essentially unchanged, and dipstick showed no suggestion of recurrence of membranous. The patient, however, appeared toxic. The blood pressure was 110 on 75, significantly lower than his previous pressures. His pulse was 90, respiratory rate was increased to 20, and there were soft inspiratory crackles at both bases. He was saturating at 95% on room air. He was admitted by the emergency department and given keftriaxone. But the following morning on the ward round showed that he'd had a bad night. He'd required an oxygen dependence. He'd had a fever to 38.5. He'd developed myalgias, cough, but still scant sputum. His COVID PCR was negative. However, a respiratory multiplex was positive for respiratory syncytial virus. His CT scan is shown here, showing soft bilateral patchy infiltrates. And with supportive care, this man progressively improved over 10 days, but then required a further admission to a rehabilitation facility for a further 10 days to regain capacity to return home. So I'd like to conclude there by reinforcing the practice points from KDGO on the importance of prevention using pneumococcal vaccine, influenza vaccine, and herpes zoster vaccination, but to point out that we should consider others. In addition to COVID, Data will emerge hopefully in the next couple of years, demonstrating that we do have capacity to vaccinate against RSV and hopefully other respiratory pathogens as we move forward. Several countries in Europe, the US and in Australia have already embraced and supported use of RSV vaccination for adults. Um, within specific criteria, typically age criteria for the general population, um, but additionally lower age brackets for those at increased risk. And here we would deem our CKD patients to be at increased risk. And at that stage, I'd like to um, pause that talk and hand over to my colleague, Professor Michael Jajul, um, to talk about dialysis patients. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Steve. Well, the, thank you very much. This is the disclaimer you have already seen several times. And these are my disclosures, the main one being that I have the privilege to be KDGO co-chair for now five years. So I will start also with a case study. It's a 79-year-old woman on hemodialysis for a decade. 
uh, as a consequence of Alport syndrome. I will not discuss the genetic diagnosis. And she did relatively well, even though she had three different types of cancer over the years, but all of them were maintained, let's say, in remission with various uh, therapeutic strategies, as you can see. And her, I would say uh, during the first COVID-19 wave in March 2020 in Belgium, she, had, she was the second case in my unit acquired at home. We subsequently did uh, sequencing of the strains to confirm that she was in the satellite unit and got COVID-19, was not hospitalized and recovered, meaning her functional status and overall health was, was, was not bad. Uh, now the current problem starts in January of this year when she has some nasal clear discharge, some cough and headache, no fever, no chest pain, no dyspnea, so nothing very worrying. She comes for next dialysis sessions and a chest X-ray is required and is negative and cultures are obtained and CRP level which we obtain routinely as needed is really only mildly increased for a dialysis patient. But still, it worsens rapidly, and two days later, her husband brings her to the emergency room for acute confusion. Uh, several falls, fortunately no fracture, especially no hip fracture, and there has been no new medication. As you can see, her blood pressure is okay. Saturation is borderline. No fever, but that in a 79-year-old on dialysis can, uh, can be missing, of course. And she is really disoriented in time, but not in space. And as you can see on the next slide, CRP level has gone up uh, dramatically, as you would expect. It's a, it's a logarithmic relationship, 199 milligrams per liter, nothing else remarkable, and a swab is obtained, is negative for COVID-19 and RSV, but is strongly positive for influenza A. She has again a chest X-ray with small nodular infiltrates in the right upper and median lobes, and the conclusion eventually is that she had influenza A vaccination, most likely complicated bac bacterial infection. She got broad spectrum antibiotics in addition to an antiviral oseltamivir, oxygen and physical therapy, and was discharged at home after six days. Yet, if she would have had a hip fracture as an example, she might have died from that. Uh, and in retrospect, we have a very active policy of vaccinating every dialysis patient. But she, was, she has a good functional status, was on holidays abroad at the time of the vaccination of all our hemodialysis patients, of course, all of those accepting that. And so we have uh, taken that into account for the next uh, vaccine course uh, in, the, in the fall this year. Now, what does KD go say? in the 2012 guideline about the evaluation management of chronic kidney disease about vaccination. Generally speaking, number one, there is a clear recommendation to vaccinate all adult space with CKD uh, uh, with an influenza vaccine, unless contraindicated, level 1B. Pneumococcal vaccination, as already discussed, and in those at risk of progression and with a GFR below 30, so G4, G5, immunization against hepatitis B is important. That has not been updated in the 24 uh, guideline, but remains valid. And the 24 guideline, as you have seen, is a massive document of more than 300 pages. To some extent, there, there had to be choices in the content of the document. That being said, recently, an AGKD paper of uh, a few years ago, uh, mentioning in the middle Maintenance dialysis space, as you can see, the recommendations are quite consistent for maintenance dialysis, hep A, less relevant for today's talk, but hep B as well, and then influenza and uh, the other uh, uh, bacterial and uh, zoster uh, vaccines. Uh, now, what do we know about the effectiveness of the influenza vaccine in patients on hemodialysis? There has been a nice paper in PLOS One a decade ago showing, number one, on the left-hand side, that there has been a steady increase of the vaccination rates, still far from optimal, but something like in Taiwan, close to 40 to 50 percent uptake, very slow uptake, unfortunately not infrequent, but significant from 1998 to 2009. Number two, on the right hand side, as you would expect, those vaccinated versus not vaccinated were, generally speaking, all of them on dialysis, eh, but were older, had more comorbidities, more diabetes, more COPD, 
I will let you read this, but that's easily readable, I think. More coronary heart disease or congestive heart failure, as you would expect. Now, what about the impact on clinical outcomes? Well, uh, the good news is that if you look at the slide here on the right-hand side, for the risk of hospitalization, vaccination against influenza is associated with a reduction of the risk of 18%. And that is true, especially in those aged 65 or more. And the same is true for the other outcomes, which are more, more distant, I would say, but that includes uh, from top to bottom on the left, pneumonia, influenza, septicemia, bacteremia, there may be bacterial complications, of course, heart disease, respiratory failure, ICU admission, and mortality. Uh, a second point is, of course, uh, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. I cannot resist showing you a very small study we performed with my colleague Laura Labriola and published in AGKD a few years ago during the first few months of the vaccination in Belgium of hemodialysis patients, almost exclusively with the mRNA from Pfizer. Uh, we, we, we thought it would be of interest to analyze the, the serological uh, response of dialysis patients, especially the elderly ones, and the most comorbid, meaning dialysis living in Belgium in nursing homes. And we had controls also living in nursing homes. It's a small size study. As you can see, there are 35 hemodialysis and 45 controls. Now the controls are even slightly older, seven years more, but the dialysis are much more comorbid, much more diabetes, much more dementia, much more stroke history. When you look at the figures of this, the, the immune response, especially the, the so-called RBD, which are those uh, antibodies induced by vaccination, as you will notice, both groups, not only the elderly living in nursing home, but also the dialysis patients living in nursing home, most of them have a, have a good uh, vaccine response in terms of antibody level. And even though the, the response wanes a little bit over time, apparently faster in dialysis than in, uh, than in the controls, this is a strong reason to advocate, of course, uh, COVID-19 vaccination in this very uh, comorbid population. Now, what do we know, generally speaking, about the outcomes of vaccination against respiratory disease in hemodialysis patients? I will just show the figures about seroconversion at the top, seroprotection at the bottom. As you can see, uh, there is a somewhat lower seroconversion rate and seroprotection rate in dialysis patients here as compared with controls. That being said, the key message here is that hemodialysis patients, number one, are more susceptible to infection. We have heard that again today. There is a weaker but still substantial serological response against respiratory disease. There is a lower incidence of uh, adverse events, not shown on this slide, but believe me, probably because they are in a way somewhat immunodeficient, and so really vaccination should be considered in this population. And there has been additional uh, meta-analysis of data on some other aspects. Lastly, uh, a few more slides. Number one about Hep B. Now, for the younger people, the majority probably of this audience, they may not have experienced the Hep B. I've known the end of that. But you may not know that in the 60s and 70s, there were outbreaks of Hep B in dialysis units. And it's shown here, these are US figures where the incidence, the yearly incidence is 3%, meaning that 3% of every dialysis unit in the US average got Hep B meaning that in some units it may have been 15%, 25%, or 50%. And there have been deaths of dialysis patients, of staff members, nurses, doctors in, in, uh, in, uh, in Scotland, as an example that has been published a long time ago. Now, the first decrease of the incidence and, and slowly of the prevalence is the result of the isolation uh, measures and the subsequent decrease is clearly the result of the vaccination availability. I've been happy to be vaccinated when I was a medical student in 1982. There are a number of additional important tools to reduce Hep B transmission. For the sake of time, I will not discuss that, but that's widely known, and we have discussed that in NDT editorial. 
Lastly, uh, what do we know about the herpes zoster vaccination in dialysis patients? Well, there has been a retrospective cohort study on the left hand side showing that those vaccinated versus not vaccinated have a lower risk of having herpes zoster uh, over follow up, as you can see. And number two, that's a recent Italian study showing that if the nephrologist is in the, let's say, the high care unit and speaks with the patients, of course, probably the most comorbid, but speaks with the patient, the intake rate of the vaccine is higher than in the satellite unit and the adverse events of that vaccination are either mild or absent largely uh, local injection reactions. So in summary, infection is important, including viral infection in dialysis patients. That risk can be reduced substantially by vaccination. And it is clearly our responsibility as nephrologists to ensure that our dialysis patients are vaccinated. There is no room for inertia, for influenza, Hep B, COVID-19, varicella, herpes zoster, and emerging data on RSV. These vaccines are generally well tolerated in that population and success will be dependent, like for many activities, on leadership, teamwork with the nurses, general practitioner and pharmacist, a clear process and roles, and we have learned from the, from the failure in our patient I've presented, and on the trust of patient. And with this, I thank you for your attention. I'll, I will, I think, immediately hand over to Deepali Kumar for the last talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, I have the pleasure of uh, talking about viral infections in kidney transplant recipients. There's the disclaimer, and my disclosures. Okay, so we've heard about RSV, we've heard about influenza, uh, as well as a little bit about COVID, so let me move on to a virus that, uh, that I've been interested in. So this is a 52-year-old woman who underwent kidney transplant in October of 2023 for diabetic nephropathy. Uh, we gave uh, induction with uh, antithymocyte globulin and uh, she was maintained on prednisone, mycophenolate, and tacrolimus. Her creatinine uh, was reasonably stable with the EGFR of 40. Uh, CMV uh, status was D plus R plus. So with that CMV status and, and the fact that she received antithymocyte globulin, we gave Valgan cyclovir prophylaxis for three months and that's our normal protocol. Uh, however, about one month after stopping the Valgan cyclovir, she developed uh, shingles and uh, on a single dermatome and this required uh, treatment with the uh, acyclovir. And you can see a picture there of a very bad vesicular rash um, on the back. And uh, this patient had significant post-herpetic neuralgia and, and it really did impact her, her life. So let me ask you um, in the audience, how, how can you prevent this from happening again to, to this patient? Could you do long-term antiviral prophylaxis, shingles vaccine, routinely give uh, immunoglobulin therapy, or perhaps nothing because now she's had shingles once and has immunity, so there's really no need for further prevention. So I, I'd like to actually see a show of hands. Who would do long-term antiviral prophylaxis to prevent shingles from coming back? Anybody in the, in the room? So, some of you might, okay. How about vaccinating with shingles vaccine? Okay, that's, that's great, a lot of people would do that. I, immunoglobulin, routine immunoglobulin. We know that uh, at least one third of our transplant recipients tend to have some degree of hypogamma globulinemia. So n nobody really wants to do that. And how about nothing else, we just leave it alone? Anybody? Okay, all right. So, um, so with that, let me just talk a little bit about the virus that she has. So she has varicella zoster virus. This is a DNA virus. It's very similar to her herpes simplex, very similar to cytomegalovirus. But the main thing I wanted to point out that on the surface of this virus is the GE glycoprotein. And it's really the most abundant glycoprotein. And the reason I tell you about this is not a lesson in virology, but it's, it's important to know because this is the protein that helps the virus to spread from cell to cell. It's also the, the protein that allows for entry of 
the virus into the brain and, and uh, cause encephalitis. But this is also the protein that's contained in, in, our, um, in our vaccines against, um, uh, against shingles. So herpes zoster, as you know, is caused by a reactivation of varicella zoster virus, uh, the virus that uh, many of us ha have had as children, uh, as chicken pox. Uh, the virus then becomes latent in the dorsal root ganglia and then reactivates as, as herpes zoster with the, with the classic vesicular rash. Now, one thing to know, we're, we're all getting older, and uh, it's important to know that after the age of 50, the risk of zoster in the general population, and we're not specifically talking about transplant now or kidney disease, but in the general population, the risk of zoster increases really uh, quite a bit after the age of 50. And you can see in this study, uh, they sampled uh, people from many countries and it, the trend is very much the same. Now, what about our, our immunosuppressed, uh, those with end-stage kidney disease and transplant? So whereas um, age plays a big factor in the general population, the risk of zoster in kidney disease and transplant is high at every single age group that's sampled. And I think that's important to remember because, um, you know, age is not a factor here. It's really the uh, immune senescence. It's the accelerated aging of the immune system that's, that's playing a role in kidney disease and, and transplantation. What about the burden of, of herpes zoster and transplant? So on, on the uh, left-hand side is a graph of all transplant recipients. The risk of herpes zoster is up to 10% uh, if you follow transplant recipients over time, over five to seven years. And on the right-hand side, I've just put a comparison to lung transplant recipients, which are the heaviest of all immunosuppressed types of transplants, and, and they have a risk of 20%. So you can see that immunosuppression, especially heavy immunosuppression, really plays a big role in reactivation of herpes zoster. So this is a slide just to remind me to tell you that herpes zoster is not always a single dermatome. And in fact, in transplant recipients, uh, disseminated disease can occur in about half of, of patients. Um, along with neurologic disease as well. And, and so very important to, to keep that in mind. Post-herpetic neuralgia is also more prevalent in transplantation than in, uh, in the general population. And recurrence is common. So, you know, the first question that I had asked was how can we prevent this from happening uh, in the future? So recurrence in immunocompromised is actually higher um, at a higher incidence rate than in, in the immune competent um, uh, persons. And uh, what did we learn during COVID? Well, we learned that with COVID, uh, the risk of herpes zoster is actually increased in the period following COVID. And in this large population study, in fact, um, there was a 15% increase in the risk of herpes zoster after an episode of COVID. And um, if, if you were hospitalized with COVID, there was a 21% increase in the risk of herpes zoster. So why might this be? It's possible that the immune system is busy dealing with COVID. And, uh, and there's loss of control, loss of T-cell immunity against herpes zoster. That's, that's uh, one possibility, but it's certainly an interesting observation. So now how can we prevent herpes zoster in our patients? Well, there, there has been a live zoster vaccine, Z ZVL, which uh, has been available to us for many, many years. And um, in, a, in a study, in a relatively small study of 26 individuals, this vaccine was given to uh, patients on, on dialysis. And uh, this was a single dose of vaccine. And in fact, there was a twofold rise in antibody titers after the vaccine was given, which is a very reasonable response. However, over time, uh, what happens is that the, the antibodies wane, and by, by uh, 12 months after transplant, so these patients were, were transplanted, and by 12 months after transplant, you're back to your um, baseline antibody level. So, so, and you know that you cannot revaccinate with a live vaccine after transplant. <clears throat> 
So we have an inactivated vaccine now called uh, recombinant zoster vaccine, so that's RZV, and there has been a randomized phase three trial of this vaccine versus placebo in, in adult kidney transplant recipients. In this study, uh, there were two doses of this vaccine that were given about a month apart, and then patients were followed for antibody outcomes, so anti-GE antibody, cell-mediated, T-cell-mediated immunity, as well as uh, adverse events. So let me just show you the, the results of that. So on the, on the top left, you can see the antibody response, which is the, so this is the anti-GE response. After two doses of vaccine, so that's the middle green bar, you can see that there is a nice rise in antibodies. And then there's a slight drop off, but the antibody levels actually stay above a very reasonable protective uh, level. And then on the right hand side is the T cell mediated response. Again, a very nice a rise in the T cell mediated response after two doses of vaccine. And this is in ad all adult uh, kidney tr transplant patients. Now, it, you, you really need to know about the safety of the vaccine. And um, so in this study, safety endpoints were looked at. Biopsy proven acute rejections were very similar in the two groups, uh, vaccine versus placebo, and increases in creatinine were also um, fairly, fairly similar. So no, no signal that the vaccine impacted the graft. So these are some of my practical tips for use of the uh, recombinant zoster vaccine. Um, what we do in, in our practice is to try to immunize bef before transplant if possible. We know that in general, vaccines work better in prior to transplant than after immunosuppression. And who do, we, uh, who do we vaccinate? We vaccinate pretty much everyone over the age of 50, especially, of course, if they have kidney disease. Um, after transplant, uh, everybody's at high risk. So it's not just the age over 50, it's, um, it's all adults. So we do recommend uh, vaccination um, after transplant. It's, it's a two-dose vaccine given eight weeks apart. And, uh, and if the patient has had a shingles episode, like, like the patient that I started out with, then um, all you have to do is wait till the rash completely resolves before administering the, the vaccine. And if, if they've had live vaccine in the, live zoster vaccine in the past, then it's a eight week um, minimum wait to give the inactivated uh, recombinant zoster vaccine. And um, I've only spoken about zoster, but remember that this, the zoster vaccine is part of a comprehensive vaccination program, and I think all the speakers today have really been trying to emphasize that, that um, you know, there are several vaccines that, that are indicated in, um, in transplant recipients for, for adults. The inactivated vaccines can be given pre-transplant. Uh, the live vaccines can also be given pre-transplant, but, but then not, uh, the live vaccines cannot be used post-transplant, and uh, additional vaccines uh, since these guidelines were published um, include the COVID vaccine as well as uh, the RSV vaccine. So with that, I will uh, stop and uh, we can take questions. Thank you very much.